Hello and welcome to gracechurch.com online. My name is Nairi and I'm one of the team here at Grace Church and I'm really happy to welcome you to our online service today. It's July, it's the summer and over this month we are going to be hearing from different people in Grace Church with a message that God has put on their hearts to share with us. So I'm super excited to hear. Uh, we'll have different faces that maybe we haven't seen so much on screen before and um, over a wide range of topics, so that's super exciting. We'll also be having worship from our fantastic worship team, so a huge thanks to them for preparing worship for us today. Just a reminder that from August, we will be able to start meeting in person again. We have a new venue in the city centre, the Generator Hotel, and we will have five smaller group meetings throughout the day. So you will receive information as to which meeting slot to come to on, on Sundays. And for those who would prefer to stay at home and join in online, there will be an online recording made available on Sundays as well. So I hope you have a fantastic day. I'll hand over to the rest of the team now and look forward to seeing you soon. Hi church and everyone else watching. I uh, just wanted to make a real quick video today to introduce you to our newest church member. This is little Frank Lazarus Newman. <laughs> and we are really pleased to say he's finally arrived um, last Friday. Yeah, so he weighs about four kilos, 54 centimetres. Um, yeah, and he's a week old now, isn't he? A week today. Yeah. Yeah, what was that? 11 o'clock last Friday. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, well, I've got you. I just wanted to share one quick encouragement that struck me, um, kind of around and after his birth, um, which was concerning prayer, and it was just about how, um, yeah, in our day to day prayer lives, we can often forget that we have that connection straight with the King of the Universe, and we can ask him for anything, and we can really do business with God. And it struck me because when we came into or went into the hospital and you're in that kind of moment of need, um, it struck me that the people we wanted to tell first and, uh, and really be, um, be laying low and texting was our church family and friends and our Christian friends who we would ask for prayer for. Because it struck me that in that time of need, what we really wanted, more than just well wishes from, from lovely family and friends, which, which is fantastic too, um, we actually want people who are going to be doing business with God on that same mission with us because we believe and trust that prayer really can do something mm. yeah. and actually the birth did go fantastic yeah so we were and, very grateful uh, for that and, and so yeah we're yeah. really grateful for that but ultimately it just struck me as reminded me for my own prayer life and i hope it does for yours as well that actually you have direct access to the king of the universe and uh, and you can do business with god yeah. so yeah i hope that encourages you yeah and we're just really thankful to our church family and friends it's it's been amazing for yeah the prayers, the food, people have been hearing us, uh, babysitting. It's just been amazing. We're so grateful for our wonderful church family. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. Have a good Sunday. That's all from us, guys. <laughs> Thanks again. Bye for now. Because you were forsaken, I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit is within me because you died and rose again. Amazing. 
me to my knees, Lord, I lay me down. Rid me of myself, I belong to you. Lead me, lead me, lead me to the cross where your love poured out. Bring me to my knees. Myself, I belong to you. Lead me, lead me to the cross. Well, good morning, everybody. I uh, trust you're all having a, a good summer. Uh, I'm going to be speaking this morning uh, on the topic of pleasing God. Something that, that is sort of maybe it's an appendix somewhat to our, um, our growth series that Phil's been taking us through. Um, hope you can hear okay. Uh, unlike Phil, I don't have all this high tech equipment. Um, I'm balancing my phone uh, on an ironing board, leaning against a candle holder. Uh, Phil has a, a tripod, and he's got a, somebody who does his wardrobe, he changes shirts. I've noticed mid sermon sometimes, maybe even as makeup time, I'm not quite sure. Um, but this isn't about me or Phil, is it? This is about the Word of God, uh, and hopefully this will be useful for us today. And I want to, as I say, I want to talk about pleasing God. Uh, we live in a society at the moment where pleasing people, keeping each other happy, can seem a real difficult uh, task seems we have to know exactly what to say and what not to say. Uh, it seems much easier to outrage and offend people uh, than ever before. Uh, but I want to talk about the opposite of that, really. How do we please God? But firstly, before we talk about how, why should we? Why should we please God? Why should we try and please God? And how does this fit in with the, the things we've been talking about? Um, I think probably the most important thing to start with is actually two reasons or two things that are not the reason. Uh, so these are two things, that, these are not why we should please God. Firstly, we shouldn't try and please God because we think he needs it. Uh, we shouldn't please God because we think that he's feeling a bit lonely or that he feels a little bit insecure about his relationship with us. Uh, I saw a quote the other day from somebody, um, I can't remember who it was, and it's probably for the best, it doesn't paint them in a great light, and they were talking about how they couldn't wait to get to heaven um, to explain to God where he'd gone wrong, um, where they, with their benefits of 21st century wisdom, uh, could explain to God where he'd gone wrong. They were very much looking down on God as this kind of, as if he was from, like from the past, he was some ancient guy who didn't understand. But of course, God is all one, God is all powerful, God is all sufficient. He doesn't need us to do good things to make him feel better. So we're not to please God because we think he needs it. He's not a needy God. And even more importantly than that, the message today isn't please God that you'll be saved. Pleasing God is not how we receive our salvation. We are separated from God naturally. And through the blood of Christ we can be restored. But it's through the blood of Christ that we are saved. It's through Christ that we please God. So we're not talking about what we must do in order to be saved. Nevertheless, there are some very good reasons why we should aim to please God. Firstly, it says very clearly in the Bible, it says in Ephesians chapter 5, uh, verses 8 to 10, For you once were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light and find out what pleases the Lord. So we're commanded, we're told in the scripture, find out what pleases the Lord. It's a biblical command. It also says in Colossians, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will, through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord 
and please him in every way. We are to please God. The Bible tells us to do that. Second strong reason. The Apostle Paul pleased God. He says in Galatians 1 verse 10, Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I was still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul was trying to win the approval of God. He was trying to please God, even though he was secure in his salvation. Through the, the sacrifice of Jesus, he was trying to please God. He wasn't trying to please people. He was trying to please God. As a servant of Christ, he was trying to please God. Maybe even more amazingly, and even more encouragingly, Jesus pleased God. Jesus sought to please God. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus says, By myself I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. And of course in that great scene, uh, recorded in a couple of the Gospels, uh, where Jesus is up on the mountain with some of his disciples, and this cloud comes down, and there's a vision of Moses and of Elijah and of Jesus, and the cloud comes down, a voice says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. The cloud lifts, and there is Jesus, and nobody else. This was God's son with whom he was well pleased, and Jesus lived the life aiming to please God. So it's a biblical command. Paul tried to please God. Jesus tried to please God, and I never recorded he did indeed please God. And then I think the fourth reason, it's, and it's fairly, fairly obvious, we, if we know him as our saviour, we love him. Uh, we love, the Bible talks about the relationship between God and his church as that between a, um, a husband and his wife. We are the bride of Christ. We are bought by sacrifice. So of course we want to please him. You know, hopefully, husbands and wives, you want to please your other half. You want to do things that make them happy, that bring them joy. You want to please them. We want to please God because we love God. We know what he's done for us. We know what he continues to do for us. We should want to please God because we love him. So there's a clear command in the Bible. Paul did it, Jesus did it, and we love him. Those are four compelling reasons why we should try and live a life that is pleasing to God. But how do we do this? I think there's a, there's a good framework. Um, I'm not going to read through the, the whole chapter. Um, but if you look at uh, Leviticus uh, chapter 1, I, I'm not going to read it out because it's, uh, it's a family show. Um, and there's a little bit of talk of entrails in there. Um, but this talks about um, how, uh, how, we, how the Israelites were to make an offering. Um, and Ro Romans 12, verse 1 and 2 says this, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So we have this Old Testament account of, of how uh, the Israelites were meant to bring an offering. And then... That is all fulfilled. We don't sacrifice goats. There are no entrails involved in church anymore, thankfully. But our bodies are to be that. Um, and if you look at the first, uh, the first 14 verses of Leviticus chapter 1, maybe you can take some time and uh, read after this. There's five things that really jumped out from this uh, that I think are very relevant to how we should please God as kind of a framework, really. And the first thing was... It was a personal offering. This was a personal offering um, from a person to God. It is that personal offering that was pleasing to God. Now, of course, we should do many things as fellowship, and God delights in his people worshipping as a church. But you need to do your part. You need to please God with your own personal offering. You need to do things in your life that are pleasing to God. The other thing that comes out quite clearly from this in, in verse 2 
Um, this was a kind of continual thing. This wasn't a once a year. This was a regular thing. I think as we kind of consider our framework for pleasing God, we should view it as a continuous thing. We try and please God continually. It should be an attitude, a mindset, and not something we just do every now and again. We also see in, in verse 3 of Leviticus chapter 1 um, that this was kind of it was a high quality offering. Um, it, was, it was not just a sort of half-hearted effort. Uh, it was a real high quality um, offering. It was something that was clearly meant a lot. Uh, it was, it was a, an offering without blemish. It was something that was laid at the feet of God, it was accepted by him, and it was a high quality offering. We're not to be half-hearted in what we do for the Lord. And the fourth thing that, that comes out in the Viticus is it was complete. I think we're to please God, we're to, we're to try and do things, we're to see things through, we're to carry on running the race, we're not to give up halfway through things, we're to complete our offering to God. Maybe that sounds quite daunting, maybe you think I don't have much to give, I don't, there's so many other things going on. Well. The final thing I see in these verses in Leviticus is that they're encouraged to give the best they have. It sort of says, if you've got a ball, great, give a ball. If you haven't got a ball, if you've just got birds, just bring them. You're to bring the best that you have. And I think to please God, we need to give the best of ourselves. I, I, I don't say this to, to, to blow my own trumpet in any shape or form. Um, it's probably more a reflection on my attitude to work than anything else. And I remember uh, my, old, uh, my old boss uh, in the UK, I, I managed to convince him to come to, to church once um, to hear me preach. Um, I remember him, when it finished he came straight up and he went, oh that was great! Why don't you talk like that at work? Um, which was a backhanded compliment if ever I'd heard one. Um, when you preach, you prepare, you spend the time, uh, you, you put the effort in that maybe I probably don't at work, if I'm honest. Uh, and I think, when I think of that, and then think of other things in my Christian life, I'm quite challenged. I've got to give the best I have. Am I doing the best I have in order to please God? Or am I withholding? Am I working those late nights to catch up with work so that my colleagues see I'm working late, I'm working hard, I'm trying to clear everything for all the holidays. Is that my focus or does God get the best that I have? So there's five things that I think come from Leviticus. It's a personal offering, it's something we do continually. It's to be high quality, it's to be complete, and it's to be the best that we have. I think there's, for, there's a few more things a few more patterns for, for pleasing God. I mentioned some verses from Colossians chapter 1. Let's read that passage again. Colossians 1 verse 10 to 12. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. And then it gives us a list. It says bearing fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so you may have great endurance and patience, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Paul is actually asking, he's praying to God that the, the church in Colossae will be filled with the knowledge of God's will They'll be living a life worthy of the Lord in every way. And they list four ways. Firstly, bearing fruit in every good work. We can sometimes shy away from works. Salvation through works is a, is a, is a terribly dangerous misunderstanding of Scripture. It's a misunderstanding that all of the, 
world religions have. But if we just do this, we can save ourselves. But we need to be careful we don't go the other way. So we don't say, well, I'm saved through grace, so I don't have to do anything. No, we need to bear fruit in every good work. Faith without works is dead. We to bear fruit in every good work is pleasing to God. When we do things in the service of Him, it is pleasing to God. The second thing it mentions there is growing in the knowledge of God. It's all linked, isn't it? There's been threads throughout this series about growth. And one of the things that comes up so often is the, the importance of the Bible. The importance of regular, preferably daily reading of God's Word, growing in knowledge and understanding of God. And not just that we can serve more, not just that we can know Him more, not just that we can grow more, but that we can please Him more, that we can please God by growing in the knowledge of God. It's crazy to think, isn't it, that as you read the Bible, as you read, maybe stumble on a passage that you've never read before, or something really strikes you, the Spirit reveals something that you've not seen before, that is pleasing to God. The creation of the universe is looking down and is pleased what you're doing. So that God is pleased when we bear fruit. God is pleased when we grow in the knowledge of him. And God is actually pleased when we let him strengthen us. It says, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, being strengthened with all power. God is pleased when we let him strengthen us. God is pleased when we rest on him, when we rely on him. It pleases God. So we're to bear fruit, growing the knowledge of God, let him strengthen us. And the final one in that passage is give thanks joyfully. There's a reason the Bible is so full of praise. Two reasons. God is so worthy of praise. There is nothing remotely over the top about any worship of God. He deserves the most praise and all the glory that has ever been given. But it pleases him. It pleases him when we give thanks joyfully. It pleases God when we understand who he is, when we praise him for what he's done, when we give thanks joyfully. So be encouraged by that. You're not giving thanks joyfully just to tick a box. You're doing it because you feel it. You believe it, and it pleases God. Just a final um, note of caution, I suppose. We, we need to be very careful, because I, I can't emphasise enough how this is not about our salvation. This is about living a life as a believer, Living our life as somebody who knows God, who knows Christ their Saviour, and longs to please Him. The things I've talked about are things that are essential to our growth, that we should be longing to do, that we should be determined to do. But it says in Romans, Romans 8 verse 8, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh not please God. See, if you do not know Christ as your Saviour, if you haven't trusted in Him, if you haven't given your life to Him, if you haven't believed in your heart that Jesus Christ died, that you might live, then all these things, all, all these good fruit, all these joyful giving are, are irrelevant. Because if you're in the realm of the flesh, you cannot please You don't know him as saviour, you can't please him. And you certainly won't be saved unless you have Christ as your saviour. And if you don't have Christ as your saviour, apologies, cat related incident. If you don't have Christ as your saviour, then you need to get that right first. You need to ask for forgiveness, ask him into your heart. You can't please God 
you don't know Christ. And if you're not connected to God through your faith, it is impossible to please God. It says in Hebrews 11, verse 6, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you haven't trusted in Christ, if your faith is not in him, then forget the previous 19 minutes. Come back to it another time. First things first, put your trust in Christ. Put your faith in him and him alone to save you. And then you can worry about how to please him. But pleasing him does not save you. He saves you. Christ saves you. And then you can think about pleasing him. So that's a note of caution. We need to be very clear on this. But there's a final encouragement, final blessing. It says in 1 John 3, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. There is great reward for those who please God. There's a great blessing for those who please God. When we please God, when we're in that attitude, when we're in that mindset, where we have a heart to do what pleases God, when we're bearing fruit, when we're doing good works, when we're praising him joyfully, we receive from God. We draw close to him in prayer. We become more aligned with him in prayer. And we'll be greatly blessed. I'd really encourage you just to as you think about growth, think about the, the aspects of that that are pleasing to God. Think about the privilege we have and the encouragement we have that we can please God. That there are things he asks us to do, he says clearly, to do them, and they are pleasing to him. And receive the very great blessing it is to be right with him. Well, I hope that's been of use, I hope that's been of help and uh, of encouragement. Um, just remember, we, we have a we have a loving father. We're described as the bride of Christ. We have a, a relationship with God. The, the Bible describes a relationship with a supreme being that is unique in world religions. We have a closeness with God, an access to God through the blood of Christ. And let's make the most of that. Let's make the most of that wonderful privilege. And aim to please him. Amen. No heart of death can separate Just death is love who can escape
fix my eyes on Christ alone. I rock my shoes. So good. God is so good. 